Hey, thanks for being a part of the conversation. Let's play it forward. These are real people, real stories. The struggle to play it forward. Episode number 599 is with legendary Jim Shockey, the author of Call Me Hunter. I'm doing great. Wonderful day today. You know, you're, you're such a hero for so many reasons to so many different people around the world. I want the world to know what it's actually about. And uh, if I can educate in that way, it's it's great to hear that it's reaching people. Well, now that now that we have the book, I mean, what what's shocking about this is the fact that I can go back and reread these pages. It's not like an episode on TV where oh, it, it went by. What, what what did he say? But now I, I physically will sit there with a yellow highlighter and, and really take down some great notes. <laughs> I hope so. I, that that nothing would make me happier if if you know people would would dig deeply into this to to uncover the layers that that is this novel Call Me Hunter because there's there's many levels uh, of, of storyline within this one novel. Put it in, in into book form and into a story form. What what was that like? Because you're a man that has traveled the world and now you're trapped in front of a computer. It's like oh, how do you do that to Jim? <laughs> you know, the process isn't necessarily the most fun in the world, but uh, the end result is is what I always look at, the goal. I have no problem setting a goal for half a century down the road. Well, nowadays, probably a little more difficult to do that. But uh, so to, to sit down, it's it just takes discipline. I get up at four and write, and uh, by noon, I'm, I'm you know, my brain's fried, and it's time to uh, <laughs> go go out and, and get up the air, some exercise, golf, anything. But no, I, I didn't find it that difficult. Do you read books like uh, from Ted Andrews, like Animal Speak? Because it almost sounds like that there's so many different areas where I think the animals are listening to you or the land is listening to you and they, they know of your presence. Do you walk that street? Uh, absolutely. I, I, I think that, and I've said this before, you know, we get in touch with our ancestral soul mm-hmm. when we're out in the wildlands. And, 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 you know, like if you jump into a pond, you, you make ripples. But if you sit still once you're in that pond, eventually the, the pond calms and, and nature starts coming back to being what it is. And that's what what hunters do when they're out in the wildlands. And, and uh, yeah, I, you know, I, I think there's no question that uh, we're all part of nature and that there's, you know, a, a kindred spirit with, with the wild animals um, that are out there. I mean, yeah, some are predators, some are prey, but. But that's, you know, you're not going to get away from that in nature. It is nature, and we're we're part of that. If we think we're above nature, yep. then I don't think we could ever possibly get in touch with that ancestral soul. So true, so true. Because, I mean, I we, we replenished this forest in South Charlotte. We planted 1,700 trees, and I swear the animals are grateful for that. I mean, I have a hawk that gets within three, four feet of me and just sits there. And we, it's, it's like we're sitting there having a conversation, and it's like, oh, my God, what would Jim do in a situation like this? <laughs> well, it's in the novel. I mean, the characters in the novel have that same ability that, you know, animals, they were, I mean, I, if you watch Discovery Channel or any of those other Animal Planet or just go online, you'll see video of, of prey species walking right by a lion yeah. because it's all part of nature. It's, you know, it's not hungry right then. The the hawk doesn't have to worry about you eating it. And, and, it, and even if you were, you know, it was a prey species, a grouse. It could still stand there, and that's the characters have that same ability. It's just, it's just being in tune with nature and being a part of nature, accepting that we're a part of nature. To create this book, to create the characters and breathe life into them, as as you take us from page to page to page, did you bring in personal experiences in a way that say, okay, I had this, and now I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna bring this storyline together so that people will really you know follow what's going on. Yeah, of course, uh, the whole novel, I, you know, I say right in the preface, this is my story. And it's up to people to decide what's fact and what's fiction. You know, if they if they can't suspend reality and they just need to dig, 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 it'll be like quicksand. They'll, they'll keep, you know, struggling and sinking deeper into the novel's hold because so much of it is is truth. It's truth. Um, I lived it. And, and it's my story. Now, what I say... Uh, tongue in cheek and you know wink wink nudge nudge that it's 80 percent fact and the 20 percent that would put anybody in jail that's the fiction part so so yeah it's a it's a um yeah it's a 
it's truly based on on my life experiences and i i live life out on the edge not not in the middle of the bell curve that's for sure Isn't that the truth so how, how did you change personally when you experienced a smudging because that is such a moment that a lot of people don't understand but it it, it it's very very connected to the universe the great mystery of course it is yeah there, there's things that we don't understand and you know the creator for the first nations up in canada or native americans down here they they um you know, they, they have a spirituality that maybe it's not, you know, based on our Christian mores and whatnot, but it's, it, they're in touch with, with the crea- their creator. And to sit there and smudge, it was with Donnie, uh, first time I, well, not the first time was with, uh, with uh, Jackson, but um, w- w- I remember it was with Donnie when uh, Wojo, you know, toughest guy, I mean, the guy is just a mountain man, truly the last of the mountain men. And, and, uh, I mean, he broke down in tears. This is Wojo, the toughest of the tough, uh, while we smudged uh, with Donnie, who who then subsequently passed away a year later. But uh, but it, it, it's a it's a moving it's a moving thing if you're open to it, if you're tolerant mm-hmm. and accepting and not stuck. In, it truly is a an amazing experience. experience. Jim, if you could just see this studio, it's filled with Native American spiritual tools from across the nation. I mean, the things from turtles and deer. And I mean, I have a a acoustic and a lot of people don't understand what acoustic is, but the importance of learning how to work with people and not, you know, have your own place and stay. That's 100 percent. We need to be and it's just tolerance. It's not, again, being stuck in an ideology. It's it's about accepting other points of view and realizing these are not you know, they're not dumb people. They're not stupid people. So that, you know, and we're not smart people because we have this ideology. Mm-hmm. We're better off learning from them and realizing, wow, you know, they are really smart, really intelligent, and they're right in in, in their perspective. It's right and wrong is, is a cultural perspective. We all inherently know what is right and wrong. But uh, I, I, I think you're right down the, the right path. At my Hand of Man Museum of Natural History cultural arts and conservation on vancouver island up in british columbia oh my god Seventeen thousand square feet full of exactly i see a picture of you right now as we're talking uh, holding a dream catcher and it's uh you know our, our museum is is filled with the cultural objects from around the world and you realize as different as we are we're all the same and and we just have to be open to listening to the other people to tolerating their points of view and, you know, there, there's a different vibe up there in, in, in by the Vancouver area, especially when you get out there by the Puget Sound. Because I remember walking up there so many times or even taking a ferry. And, and there's just something that speaks to you in the presence of all of that. Because as a human being, there's nothing I can ever do to create something so beautiful. No, the, and it's, it's a primal, you know, it's temperate rainforest, eh? you know, the dripping like Spanish ferns and, or Spanish moss and the ferns. When you walk through one of those old growth forests, uh, it, it is, yeah, it, it's a moving experience uh, when you're on the ground, it, let alone looking at it, you know, from the water, from a ferry or, or, or wherever you happen to be. It's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's a neat place. It's a neat place uh, that it was inhabited 23,000 years ago wow. by cultures that aren't here anymore. I mean, they're gone. Um, so, so yeah, it, it's a neat place. It's the, beginning of us here in North America, apparently. Do you think that the North American deer, especially the whitetail, are becoming too friendly with humans? Because I've got six and eight point bucks in my forest. They're not running away from me, dude. They sit, they'll stare at me. <laughs> they wag their tail at me. I mean, it's it's almost like we have this relationship and I'm going, I don't think we're supposed to be doing this. Yeah, you know, it, it, the Garden of Eden would have been a neat place. Um, <laughs> and But, you know, we unfortunately, you know, that that's gone. So, this this is a you know it's an interesting time when we don't need the food and someday we're going to need the food yeah and then the deer will be running trust me and and you know there's places where they still have that uh, predator prey relationship with us but uh, you know I don't think it's a bad thing uh, when when animals are are habituated to humans in that way but I I do think ultimately it'll prove to be un, unsustainable nature doesn't allow that if you let too many of the animals inhabit a, a too small a space you know disease uh, will deal with the problem that's that's what she's a, she's a harsh taskmaster so right now enjoy your deer but it, it probably isn't always going to be that way and it wasn't always that way in the past 
I'll tell you what, the, the, the way of the world right now, I, I have more fear for the innocent animals. And, and, I, and I think sometimes I'm the insane one here because I'm thinking about all of the wild animals because one, one moment can change the entire planet. Yeah, yeah, we, we're, we're, on, a, we're an inter, on an interesting course as humanity right now. That, um, and, the, and the wildlife, yeah, I mean, let, let's face it, there's 25 billion chickens in this world right now. <laughs> there's, there's 7 billion head of cattle. You know, there's 8 billion of us. There's 5 billion sheep, 5 billion goats. So, you know, that used to be wildlife, but now it's these, these domesticated species, and we've done it so that there could be 8 billion of us. We live symbiotically with those species. Even, you know, they're, they're, chickens are arguably the most adaptive creature that's ever existed. Yeah, so so it, you know we're we're on a, a course that the wildlife is probably you, you know going to suffer the wildlife as we know it. But mm-hmm. you know, talk to me and talk to me in a million years. Uh, talk to me in a hundred million years, and, and we'll see what what's happened to this work Earth. But uh, right now we're yeah we're we're headed on a on a course that's probably not great for the wildlife. Right. I'll tell you what, those chickens were important to us as farmers up there in Montana and Wyoming because we'd grab those chickens at 5 o'clock in the morning, go out to the haystack, throw it up there on the haystack, and it would find a mouse or something, and we wouldn't be startled. We needed those chickens to protect us. And, man, they were very loyal at that. Sure, yeah, well, it's a symbiotic relationship. You know, now they realize that they're going to get eaten, or maybe they don't realize. Maybe that's their... Maybe that's what's great about being a chicken. You don't look forward. Human beings, we can look forward I don't know if that's a curse or uh, or a blessing, but the mouse great. You know, it's it's uh, it's it's symbiotic relation. It's looking after you. You're looking after it. Yeah, yeah. The book that you've written is called "Call Me the Hunter." Um, I I love this that you continue to reach out to real people because one of my very good friends, Keith Hawthorne, has nothing but the greatest things to share about you because he's had an experience with you. And and he, and he goes, "My God," he says, "You have no idea what kind of a storyteller this guy is," and and you prove it over and over again with what you touch. Well, thank you. That that is yeah. Call me Hunter is is truly my story and uh and and i'm hoping that it resonates with you know people outside of our you know the vertical outdoor lifestyle living people you know the field to table people i'm hoping that it'll it'll reach into their lives because just because it's a good story mm-hmm. and you know they they can be diametrically opposed uh, to what i believe in but yeah, I'm hoping that they'll they'll be open minded enough to at least give it a read. How come we've never seen moose on on the menu? I mean, because we have a restaurant just up the street here that has elk, and and I I love venison. I mean, but why why have we never seen moose on the table? You know, here in North America, we don't, we have the North American wildlife model of wildlife management. Europe, you can see wild animals on the menu: red stag. You know, you can see roe deer. Yeah, but. But here in North America, we're not allowed to buy and sell wild game. So the elk that you're seeing are actually, they're not domesticated, but they're raised in a high fence. Okay. Um, Same with the bison that you might be able to buy. Mm -hmm. Uh, But you won't find any wild game on the menu. And I think part of that is because of the market hunting back, you know, in the turn of the 20th century, beginning of the 20th century, with where they almost wiped out the ducks of the world and the geese of North America because the demand for their meat in in new york city was high enough that it pretty well decimated the population you know it wasn't hunting it was commercial harvest of these animals so so here in north america they uh, i think it was teddy roosevelt was uh responsible for it he said no we're not we are not allowing people to sell wild game meat in north america so that's the way it stays to this day thank goodness you know because if you want to eat wild game you got to go you got to go get it yeah, and you've dealt with poachers, haven't you? My God, I can't imagine where your heart went when you when you had to go face to face. You know, close situations, especially in places like Africa, you know, where life, you know, the the, the value of life is not like you know we they don't hold it on a pedestal. It's just they're there and they get killed, and that's the end of that. But they'll kill you by the same, yeah. you know, without a, a lot of compunction if they're doing something illegally. So so yeah, I, I've been over in Africa on the poaching patrols. Um, and 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 you, but you got to do what you got to do. The wildlife needs all the help it can get, and that's parks are wonderful, but that's inside the parks. What about outside the parks? The wildlife, yep. you know. So that that's where the conservation dollars come in, and that's where anti poaching is a, is a big factor. Jim, you talk about Africa. I've read nothing but stories about how that seems to be the prime spot for for building you know and bigger things, which is going to take away the jungles and take away the the flatlands as well. 
Yeah, I mean, Africa is being colonized economically uh, by China right now. It's been like that for 20 years. When I was over there, I'd see, you know, whole, I mean, truckloads of Chinese workers and they're damming up rivers. They're dealing with the governments directly and, and the governments are indebted to the Chinese. So it's you know, two ways you can colonize, militarily or economically. So what you're seeing is is Africa being colonized and for the resources and and that means wildlife is not high on that priority list because there's no real value there so whatever the habitat is that that's the biggest threat to wildlife these days is, is habitat loss mm-hmm. around the world it's it's not hunting and it, even poaching to a degree i mean it, specific areas specific species yes but habitat loss is the biggest problem and the extraction of natural resources without any oversight um over in africa is is going to be it's decimating the wildlife populations are we doing damage to the environment when when businesses watershed or they create these little watershed areas inside uh, you know I, it, that's a pretty specific question i'm not educated on it but uh but uh, you know I, anything you're doing to try and maintain you know wild space for for wild animals mm-hmm. is, is a good thing uh, you know is it sustainable and is it realistic in the long term Probably not. I think it's more a virtue signaling and, and feel good projects. But, but you know, in that area, people devote their time to a, a given project. Great. You know, I think really though, if you look at the bigger picture, there's there's bigger overriding issues that that we need to deal with. Uh, that are the you know the little tiny enclaves are not the way to protect wildlife going into the future. Because I'm so attached to movie promotions, I when I read your book like like a movie, and and I, I and all the way through this book, I've I've said, okay, I see that the director is going to be Clint Eastwood, and it's going to be Alec Baldwin, and and it, so that team is going to make this book come to life on that big screen. Yeah, interesting. You know, I mean, great great uh, producer and director, and and Alec Baldwin. I never really thought about him as uh, as as the character, but. Uh, you know, maybe Zhivago. I don't know no. if I'd see him as <laughs> as Hunter. <laughs> you know, I, I, I was thinking, I was thinking uh, more like Kevin Costner or something. Oh, not, I'll give not, you that. Yeah, like Baldwin. <laughs> but uh, yeah, yeah, that's interesting. I I, it, I, ri- I write cinematically, so yeah. because that's how I my brain works. That's how I think. I you know, I've been produced five hundred hours of television over the years. So I, when I write, I'm actually seeing it. I mean, yeah. I'm glad to hear that when you're reading it, you're seeing it just like I wanted you to see it. Yeah, because there's a flow to it, Jim. There's The flow is is that you're, you're taking us to the next page. So, I mean, it's one of those where it's like, okay, I'll read one more page and I'll put the book down. No, you end up reading 10 more pages. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, you know, I'm, I'm reading it again myself. And I, goodness sakes, I've read it 10 times. I read it to my <laughs> wife, Louise, uh, out loud even. Uh, I, I read it to myself out loud at one point. But, you know, I'm reading it again to, to just, you know, now that with time, and and I'm last night I I should have been asleep by ten o'clock and it was still eleven I was I was still reading my own stupid novel it's like uh, you know uh, but I, I was curious okay because I could you know I mean I can remember of course but I you know if I just read it as a reader I, I'm uh, I'm just like you I. I want to keep going and see what okay what's next what's next <laughs> that's it please come back to the show anytime in the future the door is always going to be open for you Jim. I appreciate that. It's it's a real pleasure that uh, I was able to speak with you. Absolutely. You be brilliant today, okay? You bet. You too.